I wanted to end, and I didn't know if I talked about this a year ago uh, when I was here about East Timor, but since this is a democratic dialogue um, with college students, at, with both college students at Colorado College, with the community, and also cadets uh, from the Air Force Academy, I really wanted to bring this in as I wrap up. And that is my experiences in this place called East Timor. And I'm gonna make it really quick, although it spanned a quarter of a century until very recently. How many of you have heard of East Timor? This, uh -huh, this tiny island nation 300 miles above Australia. Um, in 1975, it was invaded by Indonesia, one of the world's largest militaries. Uh, it was invaded by Indonesia after then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and President Gerald Ford went to Indonesia, this huge archipelago, the largest Muslim country in the world, about 13,000 islands, and met with a long reigning dictator named Suharto. They gave the go-ahead for the Indonesian military to, to invade East Timor. 90% of the weapons used were from the United States, they had trained <coughs> the soldiers, they had armed them, and they had financed them. On December 7, 75, Indonesia closed East Timor to the outside world and they made, invaded by land, by air, and by sea. They then commenced the slaughter, one of the great genocides of the late 20th century. I got a chance to go to Timor about 16 years later. The Indonesian military, armed by the United States, had then killed off a third of the population. The people were utterly desperate. I went there with a great journalist named Alan Nairn. The following year, in 1991, we went back because a UN delegation was gonna to go to investigate the human rights situation. Everywhere we went before the delegation came, young people took refuge in Catholic churches. It's the only institution allowed to stand by the Indonesian military and they wanted to speak to the delegation. But everywhere we heard the Indonesian military had come to the village and said, if you speak to the delegation, we'll kill you to the seventh generation. Um, that was the line most commonly used. A nationwide death threat had been issued. On November 12th, on the day that we came at the end of October, 1991, we went to the main Catholic church. The people were crying in the church. We didn't know if it was the standard sorrow of Timor or if something had happened. And we learned that the night before, the Indonesian military had surrounded the church and shot to death a young man at point blank range named Sebastio Gomez. The next day was the funeral for him. And most people didn't know who he was, but the sanctity of their church had been violated. So the people came out and they marched from the main Catholic church in Delhi to the cemetery to bury him. We'd never seen anything like it. In a land with no freedom of assembly, no freedom of press, no freedom of speech, the people put up their hands in the V sign and shouted, Viva East Timor, Viva Independence, Viva Sebastian. We went around the country for two weeks and we learned that the UN delegation wasn't gonna come. So there would be no protection for the people, the young people who had taken refuge in the churches. Then the morning of November 12th, 1991, a thousand people, well, about a thousand people went to the mass at the church about six in the morning. The priests had to go outside to give communion. And then, the young people went out into the streets and they pulled out bed sheets they'd hidden in their blouses of their Catholic school uniforms that said things like, why the Indonesian military shoot our church? They appealed to President Bush, that was George H.W. Bush at the time. They appealed to the UN and they marched through the streets of Dili, this geography of pain where every other building they passed, Timorese had been hurt. <coughs> they were held at the back of hotels, they were, women were raped in Indonesian officials' homes. Um, Timorese were killed in army and police barracks of the Indonesian military and police. And they walked, thousands joined, and they made their way to the cemetery. Alan and I were interviewing people when we got to the cemetery. Um, we were in the middle of the crowd, and then we saw from the direction the procession had come, hundreds of US sol hundreds of Indonesian soldiers carrying their USM-16s at the ready position. They were walking about 10 to 12 abreast. We walked to the front of the crowd, knowing 
that the Indonesian military had committed many massacres in the past. Maybe we could stop this attack just by our presence. We always hid our equipment because any Timorese caught talking to a journalist could be disappeared. Now we wanted to make clear who we were. So I put my headphones on, I slung my tape recorder over my shoulder, and I put up my microphone like a flag. Alan put the camera above his head. We walked to the front of the crowd. The soldiers marched up, USM-16s at the ready position. They marched around the corner. They marched past us, and without any hesitation, without any provocation, without any warning, they opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down from right to left. Little boy behind us exploded from the gunfire with his hands up in the peace sign, in the Viva sign, Viva East Timor. So then a group of them came at us. One of the soldiers grabbed my mic, was waving it. This is what he didn't want to see. And they were shouting two things. Well, first they beat me to the ground. Alan got a photograph of the soldiers opening fire. And then he jumped on top of me to protect me. And they took their USM-16s like baseball bats, slammed them against his skull until they fractured it. We were lying on the ground. Alan was covered in blood. And they put their guns to our heads in firing squad fashion. They were deciding whether to kill us. Um, they shouted two things, Australia and politique. They were shouting politique because they were saying, we were political to witness this. But that's our job as journalists, to go to where the silence is. They were also shouting, Australia, Australia. <clears throat> and we knew what they meant. Years before, when Indonesia first invaded, there were five Australian-based journalists covering the invasion. And they lined them up against a house in a town called Balibo, and they executed them all. The sixth was named Roger East. He was in a radio station in Dili, the capital of Timor. And they broke into the radio station as he was reporting for the world the day after the invasion. This was December 8, 1975 the day that Henry Kissinger and Gerald Ford were flying away from Indonesia. And as he reported to the world, they dragged him out of the radio station. And as he shouted up from Australia, they shot him into the harbor with so many thousands of Timorese. The Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. We believe because years later, Australia and Indonesia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, dividing up Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. So as we lay on the ground, Alan covered in blood, we wanted to make clear we weren't from Australia. I kept shouting, America, America. They'd stripped us now of everything. The only thing I had left was my passport. I threw it at them, and I was born in Washington, D.C. And so it said that on the passport. They, had now, they would kick me in the stomach when I get my breath back. I kept repeating, America, America, we're from America. Finally, they pulled the guns from our heads. We believe because they were from the same country, rather, we believe that they pulled the guns from our heads because we were from the same country their weapons were from. And they would have to pay a price for killing us that they'd never had to kill for paying for killing the Timorese. A Red Cross Jeep pulled up. We were able to get into it. Oh, scores of Timorese jumped on top of us and on top of the vehicle. They tried to escape this killing field. And we drove as a human mass to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us. Not because we were in worse shape than the Timorese. I mean, these were where brave young Timorese dragged their friends, brothers, and sisters who were shot to try to save them. They were so incredibly brave. You know, there is video of them in the cemetery um, that a British videographer took and buried the video in a fresh grave. And it shows that they would try to run across the cemetery to escape the gunfire. But if someone they knew died or someone they knew was shot, they would stop and hold them so they wouldn't die alone. So these were the lucky Timorese who had survived but were shot. But when the doctors and nurses saw us, I think they cried because of two things. What we represent to the people of Timor, but not just me and Alan and not just the people of Timor, what all of us represent, not only the people of Timor, but to the people of Haiti, to the people of 
countries all over the world, two things. We represent the sword and the shield. The sword, because all too often, the US uses weapons as they do in Iraq and Afghanistan, or supports human rights abusing regimes like Indonesia. But that's our government. The Timorese also see the population, the American people, as the shield, that they can save them simply by speaking out. They do everything they can. When they protest in the street, they're gunned down. But we, we can call a Congress member and say, stop providing weapons to human rights abusing regimes. But they saw that sword, they saw that shield bloody that day. And it just deepened their despair. We moved on to the bishop's house where thousands had taken refuge. We were sure the Indonesian military would raid the hospital where the surviving Timorese were. Bishop Bello was the Bishop of Timor. He would later win the Nobel Peace Prize, Bishop Carlos Jimenez Bello. When he saw Alan covered in blood, he helped me clean him up, got him a new shirt. Um, his, Alan's head was like a, he had dark hair, a bathing cap, glistening in the sun of blood. We cleaned up his neck so that you could hardly see the blood for the moment. I wrapped Alan's bloody shirt around my waist under a towel because we knew we couldn't stop the massacre and the killings there. We continued to hear gunfire. We had to get out of the country. And only from there could we apply pressure. Would other countries apply pressure? We made our way to the airport, only one plane out that day. Um, and when we got there, the whole city was shut down. Um, the Indonesian soldiers who ran the airport they were screaming and shouting when they saw us. Um, we demanded to be able to get on this plane. And they ultimately decided we could. Either there was a gap in communications with the massacre site, or they had decided not to kill us at the massacre site, and now they wanted us out of the country. We made our way across the tarmac. Um, Alan could hardly walk. He had electrical charges going through his body from the beating of the US M16s. So I kept stopping and saying, I want to look one more time at this beautiful country. We didn't want to let them know how injured he was, because then they would connect him to what had happened, um, to the site being there. And we didn't know what would happen then. The Indonesian military killed more than 250 Timorese on that day. And that was not one of the larger massacres. When we got into the plane and the flight attendants closed the doors, they handed me a silver bowl of water and they said, clean him about Alan. We flew on to West Timor, which was a part of Indonesia, onto Bali, considered a paradise on earth, but actually fiercely monitored by the Indonesian military. And there we made a call to the West and said, there's been a massacre in Timor. Um, Alan made the call, and I took the towel and kept wiping the phone off. It was just covered in blood because he had put it against his head. We were able to fly out from, from Bali to Guam, where there's a U.S. naval base, and as soon as they closed the doors on the continental flight to fly us to Guam, the flight attendants called for naval doctors to help Alan. Um, we got to Guam, and while they wanted us to go into the naval hospital, we knew they would cut off all access to us. And the point of getting out of Timor that day was to report to the outside world. So we had an ambulance come up from the Guam Memorial Hospital. They loaded Alan in. We got to the hospital. As they sewed up his head, he never stopped talking on the phone. I mean, hundreds of calls were coming in from the press around the world. Um, I would feel them. Alan, even as he was being operated on, would tell what happened on that day, November 12th, 91. We made our way to the United States, held a news conference of the National Press Club in Washington after they operated on Alan, said that the weapons used were from the United States. The US had supported the Indonesian army for all of these years. Eight years later, in 2000, the people got to vote for their freedom in East Timor in a UN-sponsored referendum. Three years later, they became the newest independent nation in the world. And though when I tried to go back to East Timor through Indonesia, I was captured by the Indonesian military and I was deported twice. On that day, the day of East Timor's independence, like our Independence Day, I was able to get into Timor, and so was Alan. 100,000 Timorese gathered, and this is where I'll end.
in the sandy plain next to the capital. And world leaders were there. The founding president of Timor, Shanana Gushmao, was there. He had been held by the Indonesian military for years. Uh, the UN Secretary General spoke. Then Shanana Gushmao got up, putting everyone to shame, speaking in I don't know how many languages. And then he unfurled the flag of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. There was this fireworks display, and you could see the light reflected in the tear-stained faces of the Timorese. They had resisted, and they had won at an unbelievably, unacceptably high price, but they had won. A third of their population killed off. But they thanked people from the most powerful countries on earth who had told their countries to stop supplying arms to human rights abusing regimes. The people of Timor, this nation of survivors, had something very important to teach us. Whether we are journalists, nurses, doctors, students, cadets, whether we are business people, librarians, artists, whether we're employed or unemployed. We have a decision to make every hour of every day, whether we want to represent the sword or the shield. Democracy Now. Mm -hmm.